Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here today. Um, the subject of my talk is about the intelligence required in the packet core, um, and you know how much is enough is kind of a, where we're going with this. Um, everyone over the last two days has pretty much reprised the same information. You know, the operators have a challenge. Mobile broadband is growing very quickly. Um, there's a lot of things that are going on in technology uh, diversification. I think that's been covered. Uh, Gabriel in his research report uh, uh, earlier uh, this afternoon covered that quite well as well. And everyone is talking about we need some kind of a new revenue model. Um, the, the last speaker uh, pointed up one of the challenges of that, of course, is that you know the, the operators, there's a, a gap between we need, know we need a new revenue model, but how do we uh, get there, right? What, what tools do we need? What mindset do we need? Um, but it's not something that can be ignored. I mean, the, the, the ability of operators to look at the, the mobile broadband growth and just hope it doesn't hit them um, is not going to work. Here we have some examples of some operators that have already run into challenges. You know, certainly the AT&T one is, is, uh, is well known. Um, but we also have that we've seen it all over. We've seen it in developing uh, countries. We've seen it in developed countries. Um, so the challenge of having the growth of the, of the mobile broadband is really something that needs to be dealt with fairly quickly. And this uh, diversification that we talked about is shown very clearly when we talk about the different kinds of offloads. And, and we've got people talking about, well, should I offload onto Wi-Fi, onto Femtos? We're really moving towards layered architectures. And that kind of diversification is going to provide a great deal of challenges. In the area of the business model, um, we've talked about convergence. Everything is becoming IP. We've probably talked less about the impact of the devices. I think one of the things that's starting to happen is that the devices have been, in the past, have been consumers of information, right? The pipe, uh, which is our telecommunications network, delivers information to the consumer's devices, right? To my handset, to wherever. And I'm a passive uh, consumer of that information. I watch the video, I, I you know, receive the SMS, that sort of thing. But we're starting to see that turn around. I mean, the, the, the iPad from Apple has a front-facing camera. Why does it have that? Well, one of the reasons is for video calling, or for, or for recording videos that then get uploaded. So one of the things that, that we have to plan for in our mobile broadband networks is that there will be more of an interaction going on, not just the delivery of bits from one, you know, the content creators up in the clouds down through devices that just passively receive it, but that the, the roles are going to become more complementary and those devices are going to become much more involved in the communication and that gives the opportunity at least for the operators to move into a double-sided business model where they're not only getting revenue from their subscribers but also are getting revenue from services that they provide to other people. Um, and this is not, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, at a conference I was at not very long ago, somebody made a similar statement and the first hand went up from the audience and said, you really think Google's gonna give us money? No, I don't think Google's gonna give you money. Um, although, Google gives a lot of people money, right? Every website you go to, there's a, there's a, 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 a box that says, these search provide, results provided by Google. That website got money from Google for doing that, right? But there are a lot of kinds of content that when they're delivered successfully, can provide new revenue to the operators, whether it's advertising based on location, whether it's the provision of uh, targeted information, whether it's you know, platforms related to gaming, there are a lot of new kinds of opportunities. And the traditional response to the challenges of bandwidth, et cetera, has been very simple and very re reactive, right? So, oh, I'm out of capacity, add more capacity. Or, you know, we, we, there was a discussion this morning in, in the panel, and one of the, the people on the panel said, well, we'll just block them, right? You know, they're doing stuff we don't like, we'll just block them, you know? And if that fails, we'll raise their 
price. Um, and, you know, these are very traditional kinds of responses, and so people have put into place some, you know, simple kinds of DPI to, to manage that. The problem is that, you know, as everyone knows, expanding the network is expensive. Um, and if you, you know, just block people or you raise their price, it's not very conducive to trying to hold on to your subscribers. I mean, the, 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 the telecom, uh, I do some training classes for some of our new engineers, and I try to tell them, you know, that telecommunications business is really, really easy. The operators only care about three things. They care about getting new customers, keeping the ones they have, and increasing their profits, right? So it's a very easy business. And chasing away your customers is not, you know, a, a very good way to stay in that business. You also, if you're not careful about how you deploy DPI, you can end up with a really bad quality of experience for your end users, which of course doesn't help uh, retain them. So we believe that it's simply not enough to take the simple uh, out. You really need to be smart about how you optimize. And some of the key characteristics of that are around visibility, policy control and charging, the overall charging, and how you do offloading in the best way that will match the needs of you as a particular operator. As we look at visibility, the, one of the things you know, there's, there's a, uh, one of the axioms in quality control is that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So one of the things that has to happen as you look at your, your communications network and your mobile broadband network is you have to be able to see inside that pipe. You need to know what are your users doing, what are they using that bandwidth for, and how is it um, affecting your overall network. So you have to have that kind of visibility, and if you have that, then you can start doing business analysis, you can look at new kinds of services potentially that can be offered, you also can plan for the future so that you're not in such a reactive mode. If you have the right kind of smart policy control, there are a lot of things that you can do related to the policy control other than just stop people from doing stuff. You can improve the quality of certain key services. You can help ensure quality of service. Gabriel talked about the fact that LTE is, uh, has a fairly straightforward quality of service end-to-end -end, uh, uh, definition, and that the 3G QoS was not very well defined or, or particularly complex. There are ways, however, even under 3G, that you can provide quality of service that can differentiate your offerings, and it can be based on things like the type of phone it is, or the type of service that is being used if you have the right kind of policy control. It can be based on the time of day. You know, there are a lot of different things that your network knows that and is able to control if you have the right kind of, of policy control. In the area of offload, there are a lot of different choices, and we've had some discussions over the last two days about the different offload capabilities. Um, Wi-Fi is certainly one of the, the first things. Uh, if we look at the experience of AT&T in the United States, um, where their network started to get very badly overloaded with, because of the iPhone, one of the ways that they were able to deal with that was by utilizing the Wi-Fi hotspots. It was they, they managed to take um, uh, a problem that they had, which they were not able to carry all of the traffic, particularly the signaling traffic, and turn it into a marketing opportunity. They said, we're going to take all of those Wi-Fi hotspots, and if you've got an iPhone, they're free. It's just an advantage of buying from AT&T. What they didn't say is, and if you please would use their phone over there, because then my network won't crash. <laughs> um, so, but that kind of offload has a lot of advantages. It takes a lot of load off of the mobile network and it moves it to different places. But you have to be smart about it and that part of that is a policy control, part of it is things like distributed uh, uh, GGSN capabilities. So your network has to be able to, to, your mobile broadband network has to be able to support this. In the area of charging, if you have the right kind of 
capabilities. You can have a lot of different kinds of charging capabilities that will attract different kinds of users that will hold on to the value that you're providing in your mobile broadband network. We've listed up here about you know nine different ones. Uh, we have a lot of our customers are doing different things, and even even within the same market. So we'll have you know two different customers in Germany. One of them, when you get to your monthly limit, drops you down to uh, the the edge uh, rate. The other one sends you a note that says um, you're about to run out. Send you know an SMS back. Uh, with this uh, code in it and we'll make you a deal for the next X number of, of megabytes. So there are lots of different ways that you can uh, uh, approach this concept uh, of, of, of turning the charging schemes, your actual, how you're going to bill your customers into a competitive advantage. So to recap, the, the broadband networks are growing rapidly, they're becoming much more complex. And in order to meet the needs of those and to, to grow your business as an operator, you need more than just simple intelligence. And we think that you have a lot of opportunities to be able to increase your business, to hold on to your customers, and to attract new ones if you have a smarter PS core. So coming back to the t subject of the talk, which is how much is enough intelligence, it can never be too intelligent. You talked about some can't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, how does that apply then to the, to the Wi-Fi offload scenario you're talking about with, with AT&T or, or any other operator? Uh, if most of your traffic is getting, you know, you dump and forget on the internet, uh, is that a problem that, that, that you no longer know what users are doing and, and, and that impacts your ability to, to manage traffic later? It could. It could. They, one of the challenges that people need to address with offload is making sure that if they're going to offload it onto Wi-Fi, that they are able to measure what it is that's happening, at least at some macro level, right? You don't need to measure things that you're never going to be able to manage. Um, so the ability to manage certain kinds of services to, to do control of P2P traffic on a Wi-Fi hotspot, it's probably not gonna happen, so you probably don't need to know about that. But you certainly need to know what kind of raw bandwidth, you need to know the, the um, uh, general categories of things, right? So that you, it, you should be, um, when you're looking at how you're going to do Wi-Fi offload, you should make sure that the way that it's uh, done is, allows you to capture enough information to be able to, to manage that in the future. Any other questions? If not, I'll just ask you one final one. I'm gonna switch horses on you. But since you're a core networks marketing guy, I think it's fair enough. What, um, what's your thinking right now, and what do you think? Where do you think the state of the industry is at in terms of IMS and, 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 and deployment and use of IMS? IMS started as a you know the technologist's answer to let's try to build a better core network. Um, unfortunately, if they didn't spend enough time, and this is one thing that the MGMN forum has been very clear about, is, you know, you guys need to think about what is the evolution plan. So IMS was, you know, if you start with a green field, it's a great, it's a great architecture going forward. And what we've found, and certainly our customers have found, is that if you use it as a way to add more intelligence, don't think about, you know, rip off my whole core network and put in IMS. You think about it as a way to add intelligence, add new capabilities. Um, at Huawei, we have an IMS-enhanced IPTV offering. We've got some HD conferencing. We've got uh, um, different kinds of services that build on an, on an IMS infrastructure. Um, and then people can use that with their existing soft switch. Um, we have SIP support inside of our soft switch that will tunnel the SIP session through to be anchored in the IMS environment so that you can add SIP-based services, SIP clients to your handsets, that sort of thing. So obviously when we get to a full LTE and voice over LTE, you know, the three GPP, the three uh, uh, GSMA, everyone is now pretty much, you know, standardized on the right answer for voice on over LTE on the, on the uh, voice over IP on, on LTE is to use IMS as the control channel to be able to 
do handoffs, messaging, all that sort of thing. So that's, you know, where we're going really hasn't changed. What has changed is, you know, how the path to, to get there. And so rather than changing out everything with IMS, IMS now is an enabler. Okay, thank you very much, Ron.